Wow. <laughs> So, um, hi, I'm Peter Butler from BT. Um, I don't intend to say a word, any words about BT because um, most people in, this in, the, uh, in the room will probably be aware of the organisation. But what I did want to talk to you about, and we've only got sort of 20 minutes for this, um, is the enterprise system that we've put in place in the organisation to encourage collaborative and enterprise learning. Um, so I'm just going to um, whip through um, some slides and a presentation here. Um, I've one of the things I'll just say to you is the slides are really busy and I'm not going to cover all the words, but it might give you a few thoughts around questions that you want to ask at the end. So if you see something on there that's particularly a burning issue for you, if I don't cover it, then please you know, feel free to come back with the questions and I'll be here afterwards if you want to carry on the dialogue with me. Um, this um, video, I think you'll see this downstairs actually um, in the Learning at Work um, session and I commend it to you. It was created by um, Laura Overton and the people from Learning at Work and it tells the story, and there is a case study about the work which we've done in BT, which, which led to the, to the video and sort of summarises how we got to where we are today and what we've been doing. So if you want to get a bit more reading and a bit more um, knowledge and uh, understand a wee bit more about how we've done this, uh, go, go check that out with, Jane, uh, sorry, with um, Laura Overton and the team. Um, and I'll just play this because it gives you a bit of a context for what the challenge was that we had. And I'll say a few words and show you the system itself. Okay. So, with a bit of luck. We did a survey when I first joined the company where we were told in that survey that 78% of the people learn more from each other than they ever do from a formal learning environment. So, what we needed to do was move from the formality to more informal learning to enable people to do that in a much more natural environment. Key to our aim is networking and collaboration uh, because we think that's where learning happens. Uh, if we can leverage that and if we can close the gap uh, between learning and working whereby it's embedded in the way you do your work, then we think we've got something worth aiming for. Dare to Share is an equivalent to YouTube, which I'm sure many people will be familiar with and provides the opportunity for people inside the company to create their own learning content. A lot of guys have wanted to be involved even though we hadn't initially asked them to be. Um, we've had a lot of volunteers coming forward to put their ideas on, on uh, video, to get involved and to see their friends and themselves on film is uh, just really exciting for everybody. It's been really simple and we thought we'd need uh, quite a lot of offline time to do it but it's really been really short snappy clips, 30 seconds out of their time no preparation needed, just hands-on, down on the sales floor with them. We got about 17 podcasts done in 40 minutes yesterday. We had a, a guy that manages about 100 people, um, and he would traditionally send them a manual and a new piece of kit and expect them to be able to read that manual and use it. What we gave him was the capability to create a podcast um, to explain the piece of equipment. Traditional methods would have seen that take about six weeks. Using this sort of methodology, we were able to shorten that to a, a couple or three days. That's one example. We had some other examples where we found that team leaders would go out unknowingly uh, and repeat the same messages over and over and over. And had they known that they, they each were doing that, then maybe instead of reinventing the same message you know, 30 times, they just create it once and then deliver it in a way that doesn't require so much manpower. And there are lots of savings that you can achieve there. It's important for us to keep addressing the way that we deliver our training. We've got to have a, a variety of different ways of getting messages out there. We've got guys you know, of all ages that learn in different styles. This won't suit everybody, but it will suit the majority of people. There is something in Dare to Share for everybody. It's about enabling people to communicate with each other around the creation of that content. From the system, they can launch into um, an instant message. They can see if the person is currently online. They can call them. Um, they can email them. And so it creates that dialogue around the content that's been uploaded. And it's the dialogue around the content where the learning is really happening. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. And if you contribute through these technologies, as a result, you will grow and improve your network. And, and that's what makes you and your organization successful.
So I'm just going to run through um, some of the business drivers around doing this and give you a bit of a sort of an increased context. You heard me talk in the video there about the survey which we did, which was really an important thing to do um, when I first joined the company five years ago. Um, but it, it was helping people to embed learning in their role because it's that part of it which is so critical to, to, to doing this. It's, it, in my experience, in other organizations where they enter into complex systems around knowledge management, they fail because they, they fail to embed it in the person's job, to give them the information that they need at the point that they need it to help them do their job more successfully. So what we're trying to do here is use social networking to enable people to get access to that at that, at that point of need. And it, it's really, really critical. Um, a, a few things, I'll just pick a couple out here. This time to, um, um, to compress to competency is really, really critical. In, in an ever-changing world where things happen at such a dynamic pace, we can't afford anymore to be going to uh, CBT providers and, and, and uh, you know, content developers, expecting them to be able to produce that quickly. Um, I'll give you an example. In our call center environment, where we're launching Superfast Broadband, um, there will be things that we will pick up fairly quickly from customers, which is really important feedback for our um, uh, uh, workers. I if we can go into a room next door to where the call center is and create a five-minute podcast and put that up, either on individual screens or in large screens within the con contact center environment. Imagine the impact of being able to get that information to all your workforce just like that. It's so this time to competency will differentiate organizations going forward. Um, one of the big challenges for us as we move from being a soft, uh, from a, an engineering-based organization to software services, that's a massive skills agenda for us. How do you get the workforce that currently are engineering-based to be software services? A huge challenge. But at the same time, as our fairly aged m workforce migrates to uh, retirement, a huge amount of tacit knowledge is going to be lost to the organization. How do we capture that information so that it's available for future generations? The, f the fact that we're moving to superfast broadband and fiber optic cabling doesn't mean that we're taking and stripping out all of the existing network and the copper network, which, which pretty much everything runs on at the moment. So we need to maintain those skills. But as that workforce leaves, how do we actually capture that information and, and, and bring it back? Um, a, a, a quick point here about attracting new entrants. I think this is also very important. Um, quick show of hands. How many, how many people in the room here are working in an organization that doesn't enable people to use social networking at work? Okay. You're going to have to revisit that, okay? Because I, I, I think some of the work we're now starting to see is really telling us that people won't join those organizations in the future. Okay? They're used to using Facebook at home. They use it in their whole life. They use Twitter. They use all the things that Jane's been talking about. If we don't embrace this in organizations, you're going to get left behind. You heard it here, and it's true. You have to start thinking differently about using this sort of technology, because people will vote their feet and go somewhere else. So um, the, the last one on the bottom here, which is you know, where you get your, your brownie points with your boss, of course, is to reduce your costs. In, this, in the study that we did, which was only with 70 people, we projected with some of the things you heard in that video that we were taking £8 million a year out of our training budget of a £70 million budget. That is worth going for. Okay? And in the pilot we've done subsequently, um, we've, we're 53% ahead of that target. So we are taking a lot of money out of our budget. And at the, at, in the current climate, it's a really important thing to do when you're, uh, you know, you're going for your budgets um, in the future. Um, I just, I, I'll put this slide up here and leave the sort of comments at the bottom. But what I'm trying to do here is that we're very good in, in our learning and development organizations of managing the 20% knowledge management and 10% formal training. <laughs> But as I said in the, at the start, approximately 70% of all the learning that goes on in most organizations is actually informal. It's meeting at the water cooler, it's sitting next to someone who has a piece of knowledge or information that you need, and having that dialogue. Question, how do you, how do you connect those people in an organization that has 160,000 people and operates in 170 countries? How do you connect the person in Australia that has a real challenge in our global services business to satisfy a customer requirement. And he knows the information is available from someone in London, but he doesn't know how to get it. How do you make the connections with people so they can learn and, and meet the needs of our customers going forward? Um, so what I'm looking at here, uh, and, and I think Lord Putnam said this, that th th there is a place and there always will be for formal training. 
I have no doubt about that whatsoever. But what we need to do is to start to think about how you use social learning to create the capability for informal learning to be used more effectively in your company. This is to sound double dutch, but it's, it's formalizing the use of informal learning. It's actually providing an, a system and a capability inside the company that enables collaboration, networking, and people to connect. Now, now those people that hear, heard Lord Putnam, you know, I love this picture because, you know, when you're kids, right, you experiment with things. You learn from each other. You find different ways to learn. Um, and this is just a, a bamboo cane where two people are actually conversing with each other down the cane. I remember doing it as a kid. You probably did. What we're trying to create here is the opportunity to formalize the ability for people to connect and learn from each other. So it's making those sort of powerful connections. We all know that we, we, can, we do a lot better by conversing with the right person who has the knowledge to help us to gain the right experience to do what we need to do. Um, so I, again, I'm not going to labor on this particular um, slide, but there'll be some points in there that I'm sure you're all reading as we talk um, that you may want to come back to at the end, because I think this is the essence of where we're trying to get to. It's creating those connections, those powerful networks and communities. As a result of the work which we're doing here, we in BT have started to create professional communities specifically to pull the capability that this is giving us. At the moment, um, I'll give you an example. Program and project management in the company is done in silos in each of the lines of businesses. The challenge is how do you connect those people across the organization that work in silos to enable them to share their experiences and work together for the benefit of the whole company rather than their part of the business? So two things we've done, we've introduced social networking and professional communities and the tool around social networking enables that to happen. So um, you're bound to come back to this one, so I'm just going to put it up there and say to you, you'll come back and say, what if people share unsafe practices and wrong ideas? Question, what's a wrong idea? Um, and the bottom one, which, which stuns me when people ask me the question, is what if people spend too much time sharing, learning, and collaborating? Just repeat the question in your, in your mind, you know. And I look at people in incredulity, frankly. Why are you asking me that question? Surely that's what we're trying to do in our organization. Surely that's what we're trying to get our people to do in the company for the benefit of them and the organization and our customers. So we'll, I'm happy to come back to that particular point if you like. Let me just walk you through very, very quickly because some of you will be sitting there thinking, well, I get, I get, I get the context, right? I know what he's trying to do. But what did he actually do? How did you do this? So I went to the IT department and they said, you don't need to create anything, Peter, because we've got all that, okay? We've got instant messaging, we've got email, we've got RSS, blogs, wikis, and discussion threads. They're all in separate folders all over the company. The trick is, how do you find them? So on the left-hand side here, the axis is about formality. I think we all know that the top left here, CBT, simulated learning, instructor-led learning, it's highly formal. You go away and you have it done to you. It's the, the sort of typical approach to it. The other end of the scale, of course, is this great debate around personalization. People now are putting their own learning programs together, and they're finding ways to gain the knowledge that they need to do um, in, in a much more personalized way. So the challenge, I think, for organizations is to move from the formality. It has to be there, but how do you more enable this, this um, part down here? And the challenge I think I faced was, how do you integrate these things together into a single site so they go to one place? To, to do this sort of thing, which was the challenge. And, and, and I didn't get a great deal of help from the IT guys, I have to say. So what we did, let me just get that to work, is Dare to Share, which is the name of the site, okay, and I'll show you some of the, um, the, the, the pages in a moment. Dare to Share actually integrates all of those things together in the single site. And, and that enables people to find the information that they want. If they then want to connect and collaborate with the person that created the content. They don't have to come out the system into their email system or their IM client. They can do it all in the same system. And the benefit of the system is they, the, the content can be rated. So if it's really, really good content, it's hugely popular, then people can rate that content uh, and make some comments about it. So the key here is the integration of this into a single site. So I, I'm just very quickly, because of the time, I'm going to run through just three, three shots of the slides, just so you get a feel for what this is all about. So 
once you, once you enter it, we can do, in the centre here, we've got a promotion panel. So if the chief exec just put his latest video message up, you know, we can, we can advertise and publish that in there. Um, we can create channels for each part of the business. So if you're in our open reach business and you want a separate channel for yourself, we can do that. If you want to put a professional community capability in there, it, 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 you, know, you can use it for, for the type of thing that you want. Along the centre here, we've got the latest um, pod podcasts which have been issued. Um, and you can see underneath here with the stars that they, these, uh, uh, this is where they, they get rated. Um, the, the key, uh, an important feature of this is, is both the filter capability, so you can filter it based on a topic, you can filter it based on a podcaster, somebody that you, know, you follow um, and is a regular contributor. Um, and you can search, um, you know, there's a keyword search which sits behind this, which will identify the key uh, things that you're looking for. But to help people, we've created a tag cloud. Now, I'm sure most people will be familiar with the tag cloud. The more it gets viewed and reviewed by people, the bigger the text is going to be. So you can instantly see what's everybody else in the company looking at right now. Gives you a bit of a clue as to um, where the biggest interests are. The second component is about how you view the content. And you have choices. You can do it right now, so this is live online. You can click on it and create, uh, and it will play on the screen. Or you could do a few other things. You could download it and put it on your iPod. You could download it for a Windows mobile device, a BlackBerry or a PC. So you make the choice about when you view the content, when you've got the time to do it, etc. And at the bottom here, we've got, as it says here, the content uh, uh, details and supporting documents. So if you've got a blog, if you've created a document to support the, the um, podcast that you've created, you can add all that information in there. The secret is, of course, it's all in the one place. You don't have to go looking for it. And uh, as it says at the bottom, you can, um, you can rate it with comments. Now, the rating system we use is a bit simple. It's based on five stars. We are developing a different way of looking at that and using uh, different evaluation uh, capabilities, and we will refine and develop that over time. Uh, but to get it going, we've, uh, that's just the way we've done it. And the final thing, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the podcaster details bit here is quite important. We're linking this into our internal Facebook. So if you, if you want to know who the person is and, and create a relationship with that person via your own Facebook, it's called My BT, then you can create that, that relationship um, within the system. And the final um, part of this, which to me is, is the important part, is having watched the content, which could be a demo of how to use a piece of equipment, you can connect with the person that um, has created it. And by clicking on these boxes here, this is linked into our live system, which enables you to either call the person, and you can get their phone numbers even come up here for you, or you can send them a mail, or schedule a meeting with them, uh, create an instant message conversation with them. The key, that's where the key of the integration comes into it. You don't have to dive off into other systems. You know, it's all given to you here. And, and let me just draw your attention to the comment down here. By 2013, 95% of enterprise workers will use an instant message client as their primary interface, not email. Because people want instant communication. They don't want a delay and, and a wait. So I think that's, um, let me just come on to, I'm just going to give you a couple of outcomes. I'm going to skip over this, right? If anyone has an interest, we've created a, a simple two minute. How long have we got? Just literally well, a couple of minutes. Yeah, literally. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll show it to you. This, this is how simple it is, right? This, this took about a day to create. Let's just, just watch it. Remember the days when training was just classroom-based? People would travel miles and miles to get to the training location. And if you couldn't attend, you had to wait, usually months, for the course to be rescheduled. Well, things have changed since then. Podcasting is here, and it's simple. Here's the big idea. Thanks to podcasting, not all learning has to be scheduled. Create a podcast to share learning nuggets with other people that are personal and available on demand. Here are three reasons why podcasting is becoming so popular. The first reason is that anybody can do it. You don't need a classroom or a professional trainer in order to podcast. 
Most people have everything they need to podcast already. A camcorder, a webcam, mobile phone and a laptop. You also need access to the internet. With these things in place, it's so easy to create your own podcast, upload it to your computer and share it with people all over the world. The second reason why podcasting is so popular is that you can download other people's learning nuggets onto your iPod or your mobile phone. You can then take them with you and watch them while you're on the move. Content, when you want, where you want. That is the beauty of podcasting. The third reason why podcasting is so popular is that you can subscribe to your favourite content or topics at the click of a button and your computer will automatically download this content whenever it becomes available. See, it really is that simple. <coughs> so that, um, that little clip took one of our uh, uh, people in the, in the team a, a day to... It took her longer to create the drawings and the diagrams and cut them all out and than it did to actually create it. Um, but that, that approach is starting to really inspire people in the company to create their own content. Um, we've had a couple of guys that are doing the Nick Park route, as I call it now. They've created um, a number of videos about agility, which is a pretty dry subject. Uh, and they're using the Lego people in videos to sort of create the content. And it's become really, really powerful and quite popular. So I, I, I put that up there. Um, we're up to about, I think it's about 13,000 users, and we haven't launched this formally in the company at the moment because I'm replatforming it to a bigger platform. Um, if you're interested, um, back in August, there was a um, Radio 4 broadcast by Peter Day on the In Business program. And that particular episode, which is available as a podcast, is called Learning Curve. If you want to find out a wee bit more about what we're doing here and the impact it could have in the future, you might want to just go onto the BBC iPlayer and download that and, and give it a listen. But Josh Bursin, I think he's doing the keynote tomorrow, is featured, as are a couple of um, learning CLOs um, from the States, some microsystems and others. Um, and it, it gives you a feel for, okay, so what does this all mean for the future? So if you're interested in that, I'll, I'll sort of commend it to you. Um, I'm just going to stop there. If you're interested, we've got some pilot test results, end user feedback. And all of them are very, very positive. They're all at this end. You know, what are the benefits of the company? Is it useful? Is it a quick and easy way to learn? They're all at the very far end of the scale. People are really engaging with this process. So I'm going to stop there. Just the top one, right? Everybody <laughs> says to me, well, surely, Peter, it's all about the younger generation. You can kid yourself that's the case if you want, but it's not true. There's some further reading there, which you'll find these, um, this all in the uh, PDF of the slide, so you can just take this for what it's worth. And then we're going to Q&A. Excellent. Thanks.